Hello and welcome to Ask EVJ episode 20, the show where you get to ask us the questions you have about EVGA products and any questions you may have about PC gaming in general. Uh, this week we've got eight great questions, so let's launch right into those. Um, the first question comes here from Hatchum99. Uh, he asks, how many variants of the 970 is there on Beastock? Like 20,000 different of them. Um, we did make a lot of uh, different models of, of uh, GTX 970. And part of the reason why was because uh, that was a card that didn't really have a reference specification. So uh, we initially had a specification uh, that we built our cards to based off of other cards that we already had. Um, when you do that, there's expense there. So uh, over time, you start to produce newer models, more bespoke ones. And I believe for the 970 in particular, we had like three generations of 970 with different coolers and different PCBs and slightly different sizes. So um, for the GTX 970 in particular, uh, we did have a lot of different uh, variants that we don't usually have um, with a lot of our cards. Typically, um, you'll have uh, two or three of one type of card with different coolers, um, but definitely with the 970, we had a lot. Um, I think for like customer clarification and to know what to really uh, buy. Um, that's something that we, in the future, we kind of want to make sure that we're not releasing too many models of the same card, um, just because it it's just becomes too confusing to try to manage it all. Um, but certainly if there's a 970 model that you're looking for on B-Stock or any card that you're looking for on B-Stock, um, definitely you can reach out to our 24 seven customer service we have a special call queue uh, just for pre-sales calls. So if you have a pre-sales call question, like what's the difference between this and this, which one would you buy? Um, you can get the opinion of, of our team and we'll set you right and uh, make sure that you get one that you're happy with. So uh, we can definitely explain those to you if you have any questions. Um, moving on to the next question here. This is from Fat Assault PS2. Uh, he said, I noticed two RTX 2080 Ti FTWs on your website. Uh, one being ultra and more expensive. Is there a difference between the two besides factory clocks? Uh, no, that is the difference between the two. Uh, one is clocked higher than the other. Um, basically, we have one that has a pretty heavy overclock on it and ones that uh, we'd, uh, that maybe there's a validation issue there reaching the highest overclocks. Uh, we don't want to sell that as the ultra card, so we, at a lower price, will sell you that same card. Um, but as the non-ultra version, uh, we did the same thing last generation with, uh, say, an FTW and then, or an FTW3, and then a FTW3 DT or detuned. Uh, it's the same concept. So we do have detuned models. Um, they will still overclock, um, but under extreme overclocking circumstances, it is possible that an ultra, like a non-DT, would have a little bit higher overclocks, but in real world, you may not even notice. So you can actually save some money by going with the non-ultra SKU, and uh, you, you get the same card, same features, same cooling. All right, uh, moving on to the next one. This is from Zex, or Zex, I think, Maxwell. I'm always confused with X's at the end of words, but all right. Uh, EVJ, uh, is it okay to mount an all-in-one radiator horizontally? Uh, the radiator is still above my video card, though. Um, mounting it horizontally as in... I would think you mean that the long side, the flat side of the radiator is is kind of parallel to the ground. Um, if that's not uh, true, then go ahead and correct me. Um, that's fine, especially if it's above your card. In fact, having the radiator above the card is kind of the big thing. Um, the only thing that you'll want to do in that configuration is make sure that the barbs that come out of the radiator are pointed down. Um, you don't want the barbs going up because then you've got a kind of a kink so that the highest point is actually the hoses, and that means that air could collect in those hoses. And if air collects in the hoses at a high point, um, then usually what will happen is it keeps getting pulled through the pump, and that will cause it to be loud. Um, if you want a, an all-in-one cooler, and this doesn't just apply to ours, this is like any all-in-one. If you want an all-in-one cooler to be pretty quiet, um, ones where the where the actual uh, pump is mounted to the uh, cold plate, it's you want that to be the lowest part of the entire setup because there's always going to be a little bit of air in an all-in-one cooler um, and as time goes on the rubber will permeate a little more air into the system so it will gain a little bit of air as time goes on um, that's perfectly fine but as long as your pump is at the lowest uh, point in that equation it's at the lowest um, 
it's at the point where the air will not really reach it. The air will rise to the top of the radiator. Uh, that is ideal. And uh, I run that with all of my systems and uh, I run a lot of all-in-ones. I've run a lot of all-in-ones in the past and doing it in that way, uh, they've always been completely silent. Even at full um, pump speed, I've never had to touch pumps as long as you have the configuration correct. And that's barbs low, radiator high, pump low. So that's kind of what you want to go for. So mounting it horizontally, perfectly fine, uh, so long as that radiator, like you say, is above and the barbs are pointed down. All right, uh, this one is from Bulake Blake. Uh, why isn't there a CLC 360? And why aren't there many non-slim 360 AIOs on the market? Um, I think part of it has to do, answering your second question first, um, the slim ones are sometimes common because there is a certain amount of surface area that you want to get in a, a radiator. Uh, and by going with, with such a big radiator, you don't need as much thickness to get that surface area to uh, conduct away the heat. Um, the other thing is potentially um, if you had a really, really thick 360 rad, um, you would need a, a potentially a more powerful pump. Um, so if you had a really thick 360 rad, you could um, put a little bit more strain on a small pump that's mounted in the actual cold plate app and the actual cold plate uh, um, assembly as ours are. Um, and that could put a little bit more stress on that and potentially shorten the life of the pump. So I think that's part of the reason why you don't see many of those. Um, they're the really thick 360 millimeter reds that you do see, those are almost always for like open water loop systems where your pump could be really big. And so moving that kind of flow through it isn't that big of an issue. Um, and again, there's diminishing returns on stuff like that. Once you get to a certain radiator size and a certain radiator thickness, you don't really need to go more and more because the amount that you can actually dissipate in heat uh, is going to be limited by other factors. Um, like getting the actual heat into the cold plate through your CPU's heat spreader and things like that. Um, so certainly to answer your first question, we are looking at uh, the CLCs in general, the AIO market, and we have nothing to announce on a 360 at this point, um, but we are looking at uh, any possibility. So nothing to say at this time, um, but you know, stay tuned. I don't know where we're going to go with our all-in-one system in the future, um, but so far we've been pretty committed to them. Uh, we've made a lot of nice changes to our software that initially had some bugs, and now we've gone through and corrected those. Um, so certainly we, we're not uh, giving up on, on AIOs just yet. Because um, we like that, you know, you can get hybrid cold cards and we can also offer that type of cooling uh, for your CPUs as well if you want to have kind of an all EVGA system. All right, this next one is from Jason Lee. Uh, you've asked questions before. Uh, why are the fans on the 2080 Ti Kingpin different than the ones on the CLC 240? Uh, what are the differences between the two fans? Uh, yeah, the ones on the CLCs are uh, particular fans that we build for those CLCs. They are PWM. Um, they're actually really nice fans. Uh, we do sell them separately under the FX line. Um, on our website. Uh, so they are a little bit higher end fans. And I think part of that is the expectation uh, when purchasing an all-in-one cooler is that they have really high end fans. We've seen that with competitors. So there is a focus on there. Um, the fans that we include on our hybrids uh, tend to be a little bit more um, generic. Uh, we did add PWM to them this generation, um, but certainly there's a, a matter of making sure that uh, we have good airflow. Um, and there's less frills as far as like visually and how they're designed. Uh, we find that with our hybrid cards in particular, customers tend to replace those fans quite a bit um, and go with aftermarket ones. Uh, so that's another reason why maybe we don't want to go with this super with a super high-end fan if somebody's going to end up replacing it anyway. Um, and then the other thing is benefits of pressure or um, of temperature rather, not pressure. Uh, the benefits of temperature uh, relative to running the other fans that we have on the CLC are really limited. Um, you can run a 2080 Ti, and we do with our hybrids using just a 120 millimeter radiator. Um, and the reason that we're able to get really great temperatures is because the GPU die is really big and the cooler makes direct contact with the cold plate to that die. So it's, it's an ideal solution for cooling that GPU die, and it works much more effectively than CPU AIOs do. Um, so our requirements for fans are a little bit less. Uh, essentially, the Kingpin comes with the 
fans on its radiator that it needs to get the best possible temperatures. You could replace those fans, you could go with higher end fans, um, but in my own testing, I don't think you're gonna see a big performance improvement. So that's partly why those fans are different than the ones on the CLC, and the ones on the CLC are a little bit more expensive. Um, that's just kind of how the market works with different products and different product lines, um, but uh, certainly uh, it supports anything. It's a standard four pin fan header like anything else. So feel free to swap those out if you wanna use other fans. But again, if you use the ones that are that come on the card, perfectly good performance. In fact, in my testing, uh, Kingpin card runs really, really cool. It's our first card to have a 240 mil rad on it, and uh, that's had a huge effect on temperatures. Even though the 120 is adequate for a 2080 Ti, the 240 did improve things, and uh, temperatures are slow enough to the point where you never need to worry about temperatures on the Kingpin. They run really, really cool, uh, less than 60 Celsius. Um, all right. This is another one from Master Vex PC V123, or version 123. Uh, what do you honestly think about NVIDIA 1660 naming? I think it's weird. Um, I, when I, I'm trying to think of when I first heard about 1660. Um, for me, obviously working with our products day in, day out, I heard about it uh, earlier than, than the public did. Um, but I actually think that the rumors floating around about the name uh, were predated any knowledge that I actually had of it being an official card. Um, so I think my reaction initially to that back when it was just in the rumor of the name was, that seems a little odd, and that was certainly what all of the news outlets were saying. Um, Again, my perception of it's a little bit different because I've had to work with these products day in, day out for a long time getting everything ready for launch. Uh, so for me personally, um, it's just something that I'm so used to, I don't think much about it. Um, I think the 16 side of it is unusual in that it slots, uh, it makes sense in that it slots above a 10 series but below a 20 series. So there is definitely a logic there on why it's 16 instead of 15. It's hard to say, I don't know. I think that. 1660 looks better than 1560 just visually and I think that's kind of some of what they were going for on that um, but as far as what's their actual thinking on it not really sure for me it really doesn't bother me um, I think that it's it, it's again like I said it's it's fairly clear it makes sense that better than 10 series but but uh, not as good as 20 series and that's kind of where the 16 series is trying to put itself and you'd go well the 1660 ti is not better than a than a 1080 ti um, but that's always the case that the next set of numbers you know that denotes where it kind of falls in the actual product performance level so if for example and this doesn't exist and i don't believe it's ever going to exist but if there was a 1680 ti that would be more powerful than a 1080 Ti, just based off of how they do their models, how they do their series. Um, so that the logic that NVIDIA has always had with their naming scheme, which has been pretty consistent, still exists with that product line. So for me, it really doesn't bother me that much. Um, I think it's a little bit more confusing because I believe that the 16 series is going to stay as kind of a mid-level card, something to slot below the RTX line, um, because quite frankly, once you get into the higher performance SKUs, you want to have that ray tracing stuff in there. You want to have that special Turing hardware uh, that allows for that kind of stuff. So 1660 uh, and 1660 uh, Ti, that kind of exists on its own little realm. Um, so. It's an interesting naming scheme, but ultimately I think there is a logic to it, uh, considering how they're trying to split the RTX versus non-RTX product lines. All right, uh, this next one, this is a long one. Um, this was a bunch of questions that came in from uh, Two Evil One uh, about Precision X1. So um, he asks, is there going to be a skin, a kingpin skin for Precision X1? Um, no, uh, we did do that with XOC, but actually Precision X1, which is built on an entirely different code base, uh, and it's it, everything changed. Nothing really got carried over. Some of the uh, interface methods that you use are the same on the two programs um, because we want to make it so that if you used XOC, you can still use X1, um, but the actual program underneath is completely different. And at this point, we don't have any skin support on that program. I don't know if we'll add it. Um, I think that we're kind of happy with how the program looks because it's, it's just a much cleaner look than XOC was in general. Um, so I, I don't know if there's any plans at this point to do any skins for it, um, but uh, I will tell you, at least for the foreseeable future, it's not going to be a Kingpin one just because we don't have that support. Um, 
would be great if you could scale, resize, change window sizes, control font sizing, any future possibilities. Yeah, I mean, there is certainly, there is um, that kind of universal scaling uh, that can be done in Windows. Part of that's been Windows has been uh, a little inconsistent on that uh, through their releases. So uh, if, for example, you're running your Windows scaling at 200%, it will affect the scaling of Precision X1, which it should. Um, you, uh, programs that work completely independently of scaling can be a really big issue, especially if you're the kind of person who games on like a TV uh, and you don't sit so close to it, you oftentimes have to get your window scaling really high just so you can see programs. And the programs that don't scale are teeny tiny. Um, so it does scale with Windows. Um, there were some bugs in, uh, I believe, a couple releases ago with how the scaling was working, um, but we're going through and we're fixing those. So um, if there's any scaling issues that you're seeing on the program, um, you know, adjust the window scaling and that'll fix it. As far as like being able to drag and resize it, um, that's something that I can definitely suggest to our team, um, but I don't know the real programming side of it, uh, how difficult that would be to implement, but it is good feedback. It's definitely something we can look into. Um, I love to see the option to detach lower windows. Yes, uh, that is something that I myself was using on Precision XOC. Um, as it is still beta software with X1, we're adding in more features. Um, that's certainly one that we're passing off to our team uh, to work on because I agree. Uh, something like a hardware monitor can be really useful to be able to pull out the graphs, whether it be all the graphs or maybe even individual ones. Um, so pulling out graphs is something that we're gonna try to do as well. Um, don't have any real time frame for when that could be implemented. Uh, PIX1 hardware monitor question. Um, it'd be great if you could adjust the range graph histogram like on the um, X1, or sorry, Precision XOC. Okay, yeah, there is, I believe, a way to adjust sort of the higher and lower bounds and also the width. Um, so that is something that, that we would be looking at with the breaking it out part of it. So um, that's something that we're looking at. And finally, uh, where are the new Kingpin t-shirts, tool sets, mod mats, uh, we don't make any mod mats. The one we use is, is from Gamers Nexus um, and Yeti tumblers. Well, we haven't done any Yeti tumblers either. Um, but certainly Kingpin Apparel, um, I do hear you. Um, that's something that I'll pass off to our team. Uh, we, From all I know, we may already have stuff in the works, um, but uh, I'm not aware of any. I haven't seen any shirts at this point, but uh, certainly that's something we can look at. Um, how many 2080 Ti Kingpins were available in the first run uh, during the Associates early sale, sale program? I don't have the exact numbers. Um, I can find the exact numbers, but that's not something that we would really uh, disclose. Um, it was a small run, that initial run, and it, and it always is. I mean, even with cars that we expect to have in massive quantities, the first shipment often isn't, isn't a huge amount just because that's the first ones that come out of the factory. Um, and so that's kind of the first ones that we have available. So there weren't many of the Kingpin, uh, more on the way, but as far as exact numbers, I can't really give you exact numbers other than to tell you it is a limited run product. Um, so like any Kingpin, you'll, if you're really looking at buying one, uh, when it's in stock, you probably want to buy it at that point. Um, when and how many will be available in the future? Um, I think we've basically covered that. Uh, I will say um, more of them will be incoming um, pretty soon. So uh, in the next couple of weeks, if you have any uh, desire to purchase one, definitely put yourself on the auto notify list because we will be getting more of those cards. All right. And the last one, this isn't really a question, but this is a very good point. This comes from Good Dog. He says, timestamps, please. Uh, yeah, um, that is something that we haven't been doing on some of these Ask EVG episodes, so I apologize about that. Um, but definitely, I can add that back in, because if there's a particular question you want an answer to and you don't want to watch the rest of it, um, you can jump straight to that question. So well, we'll be adding those in as well uh, in this episode and in future episodes. All right, so that's it for this episode of Ask EVGA. Uh, again, leave your comment, your questions in the comment section below, and I'll cut, uh, cover those in a future episode. I'm sorry if I wasn't able to cover your question. I usually will handpick seven or eight, um, so there's not always, can't always get them all, um, but uh, keep asking, and if there's, especially if there's a lot of people to upvote it, um, I'll try to answer that question on a future episode. As ever, you have a good rest of your day.